I am trying a new microphone today, so can you tap in the chat if you can hear me okay? I am excited to be back for another Ask a Clarinet Teacher with my hair looking its usual crazy itself, so I will go ahead and work this peacock look out for today. Um, but I already see some people that are writing questions. Shane, it's good to see you here, or see you here. Um, you are one of my steadfast people that I um, hear from and see all the time, so yay and welcome back. And thank you for already putting some questions in the chat. I am going to jump right in. Um, because they, uh, the first one is a really, really good one. I actually saw it right before I hopped on and I was going to go and try and get um, some products that I use. There's some great products out there for cleaning mouthpieces. Um, so Shane's question is tips on cleaning a mouthpiece. Mine is really starting to smell and I am sorry about that Shane. Um, so for cleaning a mouthpiece, I've actually talked to a lot of different mouthpiece manufacturers and clarinet manufacturers and really the gold standard seems to be lemon juice. Nice lukewarm water, room temperature water and some lemon juice and a soft cloth. When I clean my mouthpieces, I go ahead and put a towel in my sink. So I will put um, a dish towel or even a bath towel in there because I am very clumsy and I drop things. So even right now as I'm holding my mouthpiece all by itself, I'm even a little nervous about it because I don't want to drop it. So I put something in the bottom of the sink so that if it falls, it falls onto a towel. It's nice and safe. And I use some um, lemon juice, works really nicely. And then I clean it out that way. When I play my clarinet um, a lot, I will just go ahead and rinse my mouthpiece out sometimes if I'm doing a lot of um, work, and then I just wipe it off with a washcloth. You don't wanna spend a lot of time um, putting a lot of chemicals onto your mouthpiece. It can um, wear them out or damage it. So actually in one of my videos, I have people using Listerine to um, clean a mouthpiece, and that is what I had been told was fine to clean a mouthpiece, but I have heard from other um, manufacturers that using Listerine isn't fantastic so fresh lemon juice will work real lemon you know they have it in the um, little like lemon shaped uh, plastic containers that'll work also for cleaning a mouthpiece you can use soap but it just tastes gross so the lemon will stick around a little bit so it has a nice flavor to it or at least it's not as bad as soap is which is pretty nasty um, so that's what I use to clean my mouthpiece um, one of the things that will also help is brushing your teeth before you play. If you can't brush your teeth, because I know a lot of us have really tight schedules, especially in school because of the bell schedule, you might not be able to get to the bathroom to brush your teeth before band practice. My band practice was right after lunch, which was such a terrible idea. It was convenient for scheduling, but awful for playing a wind instrument. Um, so in that case, I would just go to a water fountain and I would wash, um, I just sort of rinse my mouth out with some um, fresh water and just, you know, spit it out discreetly. Um, you can also use mouthwash if you don't have a chance to brush your teeth, but ideally brush your teeth before you play and that will help prevent it too. Um, don't, you know, drink soda while you're playing or coffee. I mean, I've definitely run into plenty of people that would do that. And I too would do that when I used to play in an opera orchestra because it would be you know, three hours long, sometimes three and a half, four hours long, depending on how long intermission or how long the piece was. So I would go get that cup of coffee at intermission or the second intermission, depending on what I was playing. Um, but ideally, um, don't, don't do that when you're playing. And definitely don't eat. Um, and then Shane's next question is another great one, which is when should you up grade your mouthpiece. That's also a really good one. When you start noticing that there are things that you want to do or you're ready to do and you feel like you're being held back. So if you're doing all of your long tones and your embouchure looks fantastic and you're doing all of your articulations the way that um, you want to be doing, the way your teachers have been telling you, coaches have been telling you, um, you're breathing the right way, you've got the right amount of air going through, everything feels really, really good and you're just not getting the results that you want, try some mouthpieces out. Um, I, you know, honestly, I try mouthpieces out when I go to different conventions and things like that, um, just because it's sort of fun, but I'm not much of a shopper. I'm not much of an equip equipment, you know, nerd. Um, I, I kind of settle in my ways and stick with it. Um, but when you notice that you're not able to do the things that you really want to be doing, that's when you should upgrade your mouthpiece. If you are playing a stock mouthpiece that came with your clarinets 
and your clarinet isn't um, an Ubel or it isn't a Yamaha. Even the, um, the buffets have upgraded their mouthpieces. I don't know if Bakuns come with mouthpieces. Selmers um, also make good mouthpieces. But a lot of the stock mouthpieces that came with clarinets in the past were really terrible. They were not great mouthpieces. I used to call them um, MSOs, mouthpiece shaped objects. That's definitely, you know, when you're going to upgrade anyway, because that mouthpiece is a piece of junk. But if you have one of the other aforementioned clarinets, they are now really taking it very seriously what kind of clarinet mouthpieces they put in the cases with their instruments because they want people to be able to play that clarinet right out of the case. That's really important to the manufacturers these days. So um, definitely um, upgrade your mouthpiece if you know, you're, it's, you're not getting the results you want, especially tone, if you're not getting the sound that you want out of it, try some out and try, you know, listen for that dark, beautiful sound. Um, and then um, if your mouthpiece is damaged or if it is chipped, um, if it is, if you've left it out in the sun in marching band, sorry everybody, and it gets kind of warped, um, those are also times to upgrade your mouthpiece too. Um, how long should a standard cane read last? Um, mine seem to die very quickly is another great question from Shane. Um, and then you also asked, I think, how, um, you said, when should you upgrade your mouthpiece? And then I think, uh, nope, it says typo, sorry. Okay, so Luke's here, hi Luke. Um, so um, let's talk about how long should a standard cane read last? Once again, it's, as long as it's working for you. So certain brands of reeds last longer than other brands. I have found that um, Van Doren reeds last pretty long, but D'Addario reeds are also lasting um, longer than they used to. They have different cuts now that last longer. So it all really depends on you. It depends on how much you're playing and it depends on how you're treating that reed. So if you are drinking a lot of coffee and soda while you're playing your clarinet, which is not recommended, as I said earlier, that reed is not gonna last as long. If when you get your reed, I'm gonna grab a reed now, oops, sorry. So let's say I'm opening my box of reeds and I'm going to go ahead and take a reed out. Ideally, I'm going to soak that reed in some water. So I actually keep a cup here in my studio and then I'll soak this reed in water um, because that's a better way to wet your reed than with your saliva. Your saliva has enzymes in it and it will actually break down that reed. So if you soak the reed in a little bit of water instead of soaking it in your mouth, that will help it last longer. Um, I usually hold on to my reeds depending on how much I'm playing it can be anywhere from three days to you know three months. So if I am really not playing, um, then they just stick around, they'll stay, they'll be fine. But if I am practicing a lot, if I've got a lot of rehearsals and a lot of concerts, I can, I can burn through reeds pretty quickly. And um, I also want to be aware of when I'm playing reeds, um, having a lot of reeds in rotation. So in my reed case, I have one of these reed cases. I just, I have about six reeds in rotation. I don't play the same reed every single day. Um, even I'll swap them out in practice sessions. I have lighter reeds and then I have harder reeds. So if I'm feeling a little tired or under the weather, I will go with a lighter reed. Um, if I'm playing a piece that's really physically taxing, I will absolutely use um, a lighter reed if I can get away with it. Usually the darker reeds, they have that darker sound or the harder reeds have that darker sound. So I like sticking around with those, um, those reeds just because they sound a little more what I hear in my mind. So if you're noticing that your sound quality isn't what you want it to be, if it's feeling a little tinny, a little bit spread, your reed's a little bit old, it's time to switch out your reed. But you know, I really like just this rotating of reeds. I find reeds, they're, they're like blankies, you know? You get these comfort objects, it's a comfort reed. I have my favorite reeds. And sometimes that reed won't have the greatest sounds, um, but it's my most reliable, steadfast reed. And I know that if I do my embouchure right and I move my air right, then I can work with that sound and I can stick around with that reed that's really, really reliable. But be aware that sometimes Sometimes it's sort of insidious the sound will change it'll get a little bit more spread it'll go slowly and slowly and slowly maybe you don't notice it as much and then you try another read or maybe somebody gives you some feedback that your sound is you know maybe not quite where you want it to be check your read too and see how your read is holding up okay so 
Um, but Shane, specifically, you said your reads were dying very quickly. Um, it depends on the reads that you're using. Like I said, um, some reads die a little faster than other ones. And if you're playing a lot, if you're you're just using a lot, a lot of um, you know time in your practice schedule and rehearsals and concerts, they'll wear out faster. Um, but try soaking them in water. Another thing that you can do is polish them on a piece of paper. So you can take your read and just sort of polish it. Obviously don't, you know, put it on your shoulder like I am doing it right here. You can put it on a table. And if you polish it up, it'll last a little bit longer too. Um, but don't be surprised if you're really working that read hard if it doesn't last as long as other reads. Um, okay. Um, Shane, you asked a bunch of questions, so I'm going to bump over to Gray Pattinson for a second, um, and then I'll come back to you. Um, so Gray, hello. How much will a standard bass clarinet cost? Ooh, that's an excellent question. So I have this magic thing called Google, and I'm going to go over there, and I am just going to see what bass clarinets are looking like these days. Um, and... It depends, once again, on what kind of bass clarinet that you want to be getting. So it's looking like around $2,400 for a Yamaha. And my guess is, is that is um, not a wood bass clarinet. And it probably has nickel plated keys, not silver plated keys. Um, and then it's definitely not gonna have that low C extension. It's gonna be more of a student model also. Um, so what are you looking for in a bass clarinet? Um, if you want to get that low C extension, that's probably um, not just adding a thousand onto that, but you're probably going to be bumping up to a professional model anyway. So your $2,400 has gone up to $12,000 or more. I recommend looking for a used bass clarinet. They are kind of surprising where they end up. I have a friend that found one in a thrift shop and um, a pawn shop can possibly have it, but your local music store will probably have some used bass clarinets. Uh, look around on Craigslist and let go and things like that. I actually recommend not getting a wooden bass clarinet for beginners or for people that do a lot of outside playing. The wood is very, I was about to say volatile, it's very variable. So, um, and they're big. I mean, like this is a big beast here. So you, you don't, you, don't want anything going wrong with this wood. So if you can have a composite or um, the resonite, I think is that how you say it? I used to call it plastic, but I'm not allowed to say plastic anymore. Everybody gets mad at me. Um, they're great instruments because they don't crack. So um, I actually really, really recommend them. Um, and the price point is a lot better too. There's some wonderful ones out there that you'll sound really good on, especially if you get a good mouthpiece and a good reed combo, good ligature. That, that can sound like a professional model bass clarinet. I mean, if you're playing, um, you know, the most expensive bass clarinet you can get, but you're playing it on a crappy mouthpiece, like we were talking about mouthpieces earlier, that instrument is not going to sound good because everything starts right up here. That's why we spend so much time talking about our embouchure and our tongue position and our air stream and all these things, because this is where it all begins. Everything else is enhancing what you're doing. Um, so that bass clarinet price can come down if you're looking for used ones. Um, I would check around with local schools um, and also like music dealers and things like that. You are going to want to have a technician look at it. You definitely don't want to be buying a lemon. So have somebody look at it before you get it. But if the price is right, like my friend that got hers at the thrift shop for $50, no matter what, that was a good price because if she took it to the, you know, she took it to a technician and they had to do, let's say $400 worth of work, that's still a great price for that bass clarinet. Um, but definitely, you know, look it over. We're all clarinet players here. So um, try it out before you buy it too. My friend even got a military discount on it. I tried to buy it from her and she was like, no, no, it's mine now. Um, okay, so um, let's bump back to Shane's question. Um, one of your other mouthpieces is starting to develop mold. Oh, one of your mouthpieces or my mouthpiece? It's really hard to get rid of. Um, do you have any tips? Ooh, mold on a mouthpiece. Mold on a mouthpiece. Um, if you can't get the mold off the mouthpiece, it may be time to say goodbye to that mouthpiece. I haven't had that. I've had the, um, and you can see it, it's, you know, it's always a little embarrassing, but we're all friends here. I get the scaling 
Um, you can see it here towards the tip of my mouthpiece right there, how it's white. That's scaling. Um, and I don't know exactly what causes that. It's like stuff in your saliva. If I was a chemist, I would know. Um, but that can be very hard to get off, but that's not mold. Um, it's just, you know, part of the saliva calcium deposits. I'm making that up, but it's not mold. If you have mold though, and that does happen, wooden clarinets can get mold, cases can get mold. Um, I wouldn't mess around with that because I know there's this thing called saxophone lung where you can get an infection in your lungs from things, I was gonna say microbes, bacteria, stuff that's in that mold that can be in your case or your instrument, you can inhale it. And you can actually get pretty sick from that. So yeah, I avoid the mold situation. If um, you can, maybe it's time to swap out your equipment with something else. Um, okay. Um, yeah, it's really hard to get it. The scaling, I don't get rid of it. I, it's just there. And um, I mean, I remember I, I saw a guy playing once and it was all down the sides of his mouthpiece. I remember thinking that was crazy. But then it was this weird thing like, wow, he must practice a lot or he's a real serious musician. I must be doing a lot of gigs because he's got a whole bunch of scaling. But I just think it's us, you know, your chemical makeup and how you work. All right, so moving on to our next question. What strength of reed do you use? And also do you use synthetic reeds? Oh, Shane, and this is for Luke too. Luke and I have had the conversation about synthetic reeds. Okay, I use four. Um, I This is Diderio Classic, um, and I, I love four. I've been using four for a while. Um, my ideal reed strength would probably be around a 3.8 something like that. Um, with Van Doren's, um, depends on which box, but sometimes that four is a little too hard for me. Um, and really, reed strength has a lot to do with your embouchure and your mouthpiece. I know a lot of people go, oh, you know, I'm graduating, I'm getting better at the clarinet, so I'm gonna move up to a harder reed strength. And it might not actually be the best reed strength for them. So, unless you are playing uh, like some klezmer or a jazz or historical clarinets or some of this fantastic music that's coming out from the Middle East, um, you probably don't need that two read. Um, I would start with a two and a half. That's gonna give you a little bit more to work with to build your embouchure. And then just go from there, depending on where you are, where your breathing is, where your sound is. If you're finding that the read is really, really, really um, free blowing, easy to play, and you're having to bite to control that sound, to get that sound that you want, try a harder read. Go up that half step then. Um, but don't push it. I mean, I worked with a young man once that was using a five read and I thought he was gonna have an aneurysm. It looked like this big vein was gonna explode on his head. And I was like, why are you playing on that read, man? And he was just like, it makes me sound good. It's a beautiful dark sound. I was like, okay. Um, so anyway, um, reads, once again, they're very, very personal, just like all of our equipment is. I get this question a lot and a lot of um, instrument manufacturers do, you know, talk to me about that. Um, saying, oh, my, my such and such thing is the best thing. And I always say, well, it's the best thing for somebody, but maybe not everybody, you know, so find what works for you. Um, but go ahead and write in what read strength that you use in the comments, everybody. Let me know, because I'm curious about what we all use. I also, um, personally, I'm not a fan of the synthetics. I don't use them very often. Um, I used to use them a lot on my bass clarinet when I was playing in the Florida Grand Opera and the Miami Ballet Orchestra especially when I was playing the Nutcracker because the Nutcracker part that I had was a combination of the bass clarinet book and the second clarinet book. So there were a lot of times my bass was sitting and then I'd have to get in and play something really sensitive and I needed that read to be extremely um, responsive for me. I really needed that to happen and if my bass read in particular had dried out, that was really scary. So that's when I would use the um, synthetic. So I used a Legere at that time. And um, for B flat, I have tried, and I tried the new Legere's um, for my bass and I just, they just didn't work for me. And that's okay, everybody's different. Like I said, there's many different products out there for many, many different people. There are thousands of us, so. All right, I am gonna jump ahead to the Super Kimber. 
what is your opinion on the best clarinet? Oh no, I kind of already answered that, but I will answer it specifically for you. Um, I think the best clarinet is the best clarinet for you. It has to do with how you want to play, what you are playing. So maybe if you're doing jazz and swing, the clarinet that you're playing is going to be different than the clarinetist that's in the Philadelphia Orchestra or the Chicago Symphony. Um, so what is your genre? What are you playing the most? and go with that. What do you want out of your clarinet? Do you want a beautiful dark sound? Do you want a bright cheery sound? Do you want really really nimble key work that's extremely responsive? Or do you like a little bit where you can push into the keys? Um, what is your budget? There are so many different variables here. What instrument company has the best reputation for what specific part of clarinet playing? Who has the best customer service? All of these things matter. It's like buying a car. So if you say, oh, what's the best clarinet? It's like, oh, what's the best car? And if my husband was here, he would say the Tesla. And I'm sitting here and I say, it doesn't matter as long as it can get me to the place I wanna go. And if my daughter was here, she'd be like, it's a McLaren. You know, so it's all different for all of us. So the instruments that I play on, this is a Buffet Prestige clarinet. I've been playing on this one for about eight years. I do love this clarinet. Um, but I am in the um, flirting stages of looking at other instruments. So there are other videos I have on the channel of me trying the Ubel clarinets. I'm very interested in trying those more, mainly because the price is so good. The price is amazing. They are a small company, so I feel like you would get very personal customer service. Um, the Bakun clarinets are lovely. I've played them. Um, they've been a little bit heavy for me, so they're heavier in my hands than other clarinets, and that is something that doesn't feel right when I play. Um, I don't like using a neck strap that much, but they are wonderful clarinets. Um, I do, I've played buffets for years. I love buffets. My A is buffet. My E flat is a buffet, um, but I also adore the Selmers. So my bass clarinet is a Selmer. I love the Yamahas. The intonation on the Yamahas is amazing. So really my, my advice for what the best clarinet is, is to go try clarinets. If you can get to a clarinet day, if you can get to um, a clarinet convention, go to one, try out some instruments. Um, that's the way I found the best way to do it. If you go to your local music shop, and you don't have a clarinetist working there, it's actually kind of hard to pick a clarinet. So if you can go with another professional clarinetist, if your teacher, or if you can go with one of your friends to try some instruments to get some feedback, that's really important because you need somebody far away from you to hear you so that they can give you better feedback than what you're getting in your own head because we have this mouthpiece in our mouth and it's vibrating against our teeth and in our skull and all that. So we never actually get a true concept of how we sound. Even if we record ourselves, it's never really true. So definitely go with somebody to help pick it out. So my top brands of clarinets, to try and narrow it down because I really didn't answer your question in a concise way, I still love buffet clarinets. I like the Bakun clarinets. I love the Ubel clarinets and the RZ clarinets. I love Yamahas and I love Selmers. Those are you know my top six ones that I love the most. Um, and so once again, it's all personal. It's what you are looking for and what you want. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go back and read some of the ones that I missed. Um, Shane, you said the bass clarinet. My teacher let me borrow his Yamaha 622 low C bass. Nice, that must be really fun to play. I do love those low Cs. Um, and congratulations to your clarinet teacher on getting married, and that's really awesome that you're gonna play at her wedding. So I'm so happy um, for you. I, um, I love my clarinet students very, very much, and um, I would have loved to have had them um, at my wedding. I, just the timing, I wasn't, you know, I was very nomadic when I got married, so I didn't have any students at the time, but I would love to have them part of my, my day. So that's really awesome that you will be able to build that memory with your clarinet teacher. And tell her I say congratulations. Um, okay, and then um, Shane said, you are using Van Doren V12s or Van Doren 56, um, size three. And now your next question is, why does the E key on the bass clarinet have a little vent hole? Does it do anything? I'm gonna have to look at that. And do I know of any affordable bass clarinet stands? Okay, let me go to the bass clarinet stand one first, because this one I learned the hard way. 
pay the money for a good bass clarinet stand. I did the cheap one, I did the affordable one, and really I think I saved myself $50. Um, the one I'm using now uh, um, is, wait, I can do this. Um, it is, uh, really, I can't read any of that. Um, but I have, um, it says made in Germany. And um, so this bass clarinet stand is, um, oh, it's the Koenig and Meyer. Yeah, and those are pretty much all of my stands. I use the Koenig and Meyer stands. So this one folds up, I take it on gigs. It is very, very heavy for a stand. And that is what you want because I got the cheap one, which was very light and I put my bass clarinet on it and it toppled over. Um, and I had it all put together and I'd been using it in my practice studio and everything was fine. And then I took it to a gig and I had it all set up and I put it there and I swear somebody breathed the wrong way and the whole thing went down. And I ended up having a lot of work that needed to be done on my bass, which offset the difference of the affordable bass clarinet stand. Also somewhere in the world is one of my bass clarinet stands that I left at a gig somewhere. So if you find it and it has my name on it, it's yours. You can keep it. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, get a good Koenig and Meyer stand that's really solid so that nothing is going to, you know, accidentally knock over your bass because that is a super bummer when that happens. I was so upset. And at least it was at um, a rehearsal and not a concert, which would have been really upsetting. All right, cool. Um, oh, you asked me about the E key on the bass clarinet. All right, so this E key right here, if you're talking about this E key right here with the little hole, that's for the altissimo range. So when you're playing the altissimo, you're going to put down this little key right here so that you can play C sharp D, D sharp E, all the way up, you know? But you cover it up when you are playing B natural or anything down below. So that's why it has that little vent hole there. Um, I think that's the one you, yes, that's the one um, you're asking. All right, great questions, everybody. I am going to wrap up um, because I have to get ready for some clarinet lessons. Um, and I'm gonna see Luke actually in a little bit. So, hey, Luke. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for all your questions. Um, please, if you're watching this later, go ahead and put a question in there. I was very bad. Um, I'm very good at procrastinating and I did not renew my website. <laughs> and now the clarinetproject.com belongs to somebody else and I have to get a new website. My old website, so it's still all tied in there. Um, so if you need to reach me, you can send me an email at csweetie at gmail.com. You can reach me on Facebook. You can reach me on Instagram. You can go to my C or katinasweetie.com uh, website. That's all working. Just the clarinet project one. Sad, sad. Dot com is no longer mine and I tried to get it back but they wanted like ten million dollars it was crazy so anyway um, I will fix that website and I will announce that soon but most people actually reach out to me on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram so those all still work if you need more let me know thank you very much for coming thank you all for supporting the clarinet channel I mean Shane I've known you for years now maybe one of these days we will finally meet in person and everybody else, thank you. Um, thank you for coming and all your support. And happy clarinetting, everybody. Bye.